That sounds good. Looks good. Okay, we are live on YouTube. We're going to let in our local audience here on Zoom. We've got a local recording coming through. Okay, welcome everybody to the Friday webinar. I'm Derek Auger, the Executive Director with Conservatory Canada. I'll just give you a quick welcome, then I'm going to turn things over to our guests today, Eleanor and Cecile, whom I'm sure you all know. Um, next week, we're not going to have a webinar on November 17th. We have our annual general meeting that day, Conservatory Canada, and our convocation and awards ceremony the following day in London. And so we're going to take that week off, and then we're going to re return in two weeks' time where CC examiner and teacher Alessandra DiCenzo will join us on Friday, November 24th to discuss her research into reading and teaching not only sight reading, but reading in general. And she's got some really interesting things. She's looked at different beginner methods uh, as part of um, an exercise she did with her master's degree at the Piano Lab University of Ottawa. So this is going to be the first in, in, in some of her webinars. And then the week after that, December 1st and December 8th, George Litterst of Time Warp Technologies is going to join us, and he's got a number of pedagogical topics he's going to present on. The first is on Ignatius Sancho on December 1st, and then on December 8th, he's going to present a webinar with a guest on Clementi. And then not sure what we're going to do December 15th yet, if we're going to have a webinar or not, as we're getting closer to Christmas. But then in the new year, George is going to come back and he's going to present uh, with Stella Sick from Minnesota, they're going to talk about the waltz, and that'll be on January 12th. So that's what we have upcoming for webinars over the next couple of months. Um, lots of interesting things coming forward for January, February, March next year. And so we hope you can join us. And I should mention too, as well, as part of our convocation and awards ceremony next week in London on Saturday, November 18th, we're going to live stream that event here on the CCTV YouTube channel. And so we hope you can join us at two o'clock Eastern time. The ceremony, I estimate, will be about an hour and 15 minutes. We have a number of students from across the country who are planning to attend to receive either their ACCM diplomas, to, uh, to perform for us. There'll be four students performing to receive their medals for excellence and other scholarships that we're giving out as part of our $30,000 in scholarships that we award every year. So you can check that out Saturday, November 18th at 2 p.m. here on CCTV. And today we have Eleanor and Cecile joining us. They're going to talk about the music of Louise Longens Jaffa. Here are two publications that came out earlier this year from Eleanor, One Eye Publications, and they're going to discuss the music in these two publications. I love holding these up because Eleanor sends them to me and I love playing through them. So looking forward to what you both have to say today. Thanks for being here and I'll turn it over to you both. Thank, Thank you, Derek. A little bit about Louise uh, Jaffa, uh, Langens Jaffa. She was born in Hamburg in 1826 and studied piano and composition as a child. To practice the piano, she often went to the Baumgarten and Heinz Piano Factory, where she met Johannes Brahms, seven years younger than her. They discussed his early compositions, and Brahms dedicated his Opus 6, six songs for soprano and tenor, to Louise and, and her sister Mina. Initially, Louise performed mainly at charity events. However, there's documentation of performances at the Danish Royal Court and for the King of Sweden. Louise and her sister moved to Dusseldorf in 1853 to study piano with Clara Schumann. Robert Schumann was an avid promoter of her compositions and she received a letter of recommendation from him. She also dealt with the composer and conductor Albert Dietrich. In 1858, Louise married composer Wilhelm Langens, and they mainly performed together. After two years in Dusseldorf, they moved to Hamburg, and in 1864 to Paris. Louise was a successful pianist in, in Paris, performing at the premiere of Brahms's Piano Quintet in F minor. Louise also worked with Stephen Heller, Camille Cesson, César Franck, and Giacomo Rossini. In 1869, the couple returned to Germany where Louise appeared alone in concert. In addition to works by Robert Schumann, she performed works by Schubert, Liszt, Chopin and others. Beginning in 1870, she performed more of her own compositions and arrangements. Her marriage ended in divorce in 1874 and Louise settled in Weisbaden where she continued to perform in smaller concert tours. She died in Wiesbaden in 1910. Louise Jaffa, Langen Jaffa, wrote a number of works, including an opera, string quartets, piano works, and songs, 
as well as arrangements of works by other composers. Not all of her works were published. Uh, the fingerings that are included in this in the editions that I've published were the original fingerings that she had. So we're going to begin with the six bluets. Cecile, do you want to say a little bit about the bluet? Yeah, just very shortly. The bluet is a is a French uh, term, uh, which makes sense that she used that because they were written while she was in Paris, and it simply means it, an artistic work. It could be a, a book, a song, a piece of music, usually short uh, and light and devoid of any pretension and imbued with sentimentalism. It's really nice and singing and very romantic by nature. But like I said, it, it, considered as no importance. I can only think of the Beethoven bagatelle is also a, a French term. You know, that doesn't mean that, you know, Beethoven himself was saying that he thought that the, his bagatelle were among the best works that he had written. Right, right. These are really charming pieces. Uh, yes. Great teaching material. Each one is very different. So we'll go through each of the, of the pieces and talk a little bit about the technical challenges or the pedagogical value. So the first one is a chorale. I should be screen sharing so you can see the um, the score. So here we go. All right. So this is the chorale that that I just played, um, and it's a great piece for. It, it, it's very much like the uh, Tchaikovsky. Um, what's the? I can't think of the name. Yes. And so it, it's it's a beautiful piece just for learning chord progressions. I use the pedal with this, and um, I think in a previous in a previous uh, webinar I talked about how I mark the pedaling. So rather than the traditional V, I actually turn these into arrows, so that the indication is for the student to lift. Oh dear, why is it disappearing on me? Okay. <laughs> All right, so each time the student would lift, think up on each chord, so. And the idea is that whatever goes up must come down. So I found that to be quite an efficient way of showing pedaling. The other thing you would want to do is project the top notes of each chord so you get a clear melodic line. be a student's first uh, exposure to that type of voicing but just placing extra pressure always on the top note being sensitive to the chord progression so it's very much four bar phrasing so a little bit of a crescendo into the middle of the phrase and then a diminuendo and she has indicated a lot of those um, crescendos and diminuendos now if you don't use the pedal it's also possible to play this very legato it's probably a good idea to begin this without the pedal so the student learns to have that legato touch because I find so often when they use the pedal you get they 
they're lifting because the pedal is doing the connecting for them. And that's not the idea at all. The pedal simply enhances the sound. All right, let's move on to the next one. Let's erase these. And there we go. The lead. The lead. So, of course, the lead, it's, it's a song, right? So it's a, the definition of a typically 19th century German art song. So you, immediately you think voice, therefore the tone quality, uh, the legato will be really important. So let me, okay. A lovely piece i like it a lot um the first thing i would do is to uh, make sure that the student understand the the terms like andante what is an andante moderately slow at a walking pace so 104 108 around that also it's in four four it's an a minor uh so in four four I find that with my students, I have to remind them often, 4-4, uh, four, four, strong beats, weak beats. It has uh, an influence on the design of the phrase. Always keep in mind where it's going, where's, where's the destination, and the shaping of the phrase. So you go kind of crescendo to the second, bar diminuendo um, and that's it's important to feel that strong beat weak beat uh, from the start and to incorporate it in the phrasing uh, finding the climax finding the destination from the start obviously the melody is in the right hand uh, the the accompaniment in left hand um, the phrasing is quite clear you know four bars four bars Antecedent, conséquent. Think voice, singing tone. Again, think tone quality from the very beginning. Uh, so legato, as Eleanor was saying, the legato is really important. Need of a sensitive touch, flatter fingers, flexible wrist, and kind of shifting the weight from one finger to the next. Um, the, of course, the phrasing is helped by the movement of the wrist. You're going down, up. You can see how the slur goes one bar, one bar, one bar. Um, in a four bar, four plus four uh, bar. Um, I was going to say the link um, between the technique, the, the how to and the sound quality for the expressivity that's essential for an effective of, of a interpretation of a romantic piece like this one. You need to think legato touch from the very beginning. At that time, that had become very, very important. Um, when we talk about Brahms, often we talk about uh, legatissimo touch. It's even more important to have the notes 
very connected for a more expressive line to translate emotions even more than in the past. Um, the brain and the fingers have to be connected from the start in the common the the, the common work in the for the final realization of the, the piece. You have to think a lot, listen a lot to the sound quality and the phrasing and the legato to get the the musical result. Um, in terms of practicing, I would suggest the accompaniment in broken chord needs to be softer of course there's a balance that has to be kept in mind so i would suggest to play them solid firm hand firm fingers chord technique flat fingers and there's there will be a lateral rotation of the wrist and arm the wrist needs to be quiet otherwise it's going to interfere with the quietness of the line so i suggest you would practice that. help to play as many notes as possible physically you develop a quiet left hand you get used to this and also you hear the harmonies and you hear the 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 dissonances the notes that are surprising um and then the student can play games you know So it would have to play just the right hand and the counterpoint. So that I find that often the left hand is just the accompaniment and is not, I have to remind the students that it needs to sing also. So you need to bring out the, the counterpoint. Um, Crescendo, one thing that I have to tell the students often is that when you have a crescendo like bar three, um, you have to make sure that the left hand makes the crescendo at the same level as the right hand. Often, you know, they'll they'll think crescendo left right hand is gonna be beautiful, but the left hand will stay neutral. Um, Another thing that I found interesting with her, and it reminded me, and we were talking about that yesterday, is that uh, there have been a long discussions uh, among musicologists, um, especially around Chopin, regarding the crescendo diminuendo written in letters and the air pins. Uh, why would a composer would use both in the same piece? And they concluded that because they meant two different things. And it's actually, uh, a letter from um, uh, Fanny Mendelssohn that was the final arguments proving that. It means that uh, crescendo diminuendo means crescendo diminuendo uh, more than the airpins, but the airpins mean more rubato also. So that's what you find in this piece. Uh, you'll find that often end of um, phrases. Um, and it makes sense. One thing that I wanted to to, um, to stress is that, as Elena was saying, she wrote many uh, fingering herself. And I found that they make so much sense in terms of expressivity, in terms of phrasing and rubato. One example is at the bottom of the page, uh, bar 14 and 15 in the left hand. Stretch to get to the G sharp with the two, and again G natural. So it forces you to slow down, and the musical result is that you hear that G sharp, G, and F sharp. It bring an emphasis on on that. Um, also, uh, in the second page, she used the sliding thumb. Uh, at the end of a phrase. Another interesting thing in terms of fingering, same place, uh, bar 26, sometimes she uses crossing. Uh, 
chromaticism. So again, a bit of, it's a natural rubato. You have to stretch a little bit and it brings out the, the chromaticism. So it's like she's writing her own rubato, her own um, expressivity in certain uh, movement. One thing that I need to remind my students often in terms of technique is the role of the wrist. Uh, for example, bar 11, you know, you have those quarter notes in the right hand, link by two. That movement, meaning that the first quarter note will have an emphasis, more weight, and the second one, because you played it as your wrist goes up, then it's softer and shorter. So it's like a sign motive, um, hope. Uh, and so I find that this is something that I have to work on with many students at the university level. Um, you have an interesting case at the end of the piece really is bar 44, uh, 34, 35. After that, it's a cadeta. Again, you have a crescendo, uh, an air pin there. So slow down and then you have a four bar coda. So um, in terms of uh, pedaling, this is a good piece to develop the pedal technique because you mostly it's very regular, very standard legato pedal. But the student has to, to listen and pedal with her ears. ears. Uh, for example, bar four. Changing twice may be fine, but maybe not. Maybe uh, they will be, need to change more often. Or tremolo pedal, things like that. Also, she um, sometimes she uses... Um, I'm just looking here, uh, not in this piece. Um, oh, that's what I wanted to show you. It's uh, bar seven. So up to there, it's mostly twice a bar, but then you have the interesting writing bar seven. You have the right hand staccato thirds in the pedal. So there you, I would pedal with each beat. And then back to the legato pedal. So, yeah, I think we can move on to the third one. Okay. So this is the canon. tricky piece in terms of fingering and there's a lot of a tremendous amount of imitation here between the hands so the opening theme is echoed in the left hand and again the fingering in this piece really um, helps uh, it's it's odd so here to tuck the thumb under seems strange but it works and then when we get into bar 12, uh, the right hand echoed by the left hand. And then the two note slurs. So it's a very short piece, but with a tremendous amount of material in it. To be honest, I found this one tricky to play. There's just always something going on. Uh, between the hands and it's a question of you know what you want to project so I do like to have this opening theme and then in the left hand then we have the arpeggio and then it 
comes in the left hand. The dotted figure. And then in the left hand. at the very end almost comical um it's like you've had all this this incredible interplay between the two hands and then it's like done finished <laughs> so it's uh and coming out of a piano section so it's um it's really a, a great uh technical piece it's a, a wonderful piece to introduce students to part playing and uh have them decide what they want to bring out in the left hand uh, I mean, there's more than one right answer here. So my personal preference is when you have the act activity, for instance, in bar 12 in the right hand, then I like to bring that out in the left so that you really hear the conversation between the two hands. Um, but like I say, it's a tricky little piece and it's actually a really good piece to instill the need for fingering in students, my own person, my own students this year, I have a number of transfer students who were not accustomed to paying attention to fingering. And really fingering is, is as important as the notes and the rhythm because if you don't have proper fingering, you will stumble. So it's a way of getting rid of stumbling. But this is this particular piece, really all of these, as, as Cecile said, the you know, the, some of the fingerings are really interesting, but they work. So even though they may be awkward to learn initially, they do work and are ne necessary in order to really gain uh, proficiency in the performance. I have the same problems, the same challenges with some students. Uh, they're not used to it, but it the fingering, I mean, the right fingering is so essential for the phrasing and the legato and the shaping of the phrase. And um, a few days ago, I just sat down and I, I was trying, okay, what could I do differently in terms of fingering? And I was always coming back to earth. Yeah, yeah, I'd be saying, because when I, when I was working on this piece, I ignored the fingering and then I was, yeah, yeah. you know, fumbling trying to figure out like, how am I going to get to the next note? All of a sudden you end up on finger five, but the next note is higher and, uh, or lower. And yeah. so when I finally paid attention to the fingering, I was like, okay, it's, it's <laughs> weird. It's it. At first, sometimes you look at it and say, oh, this is surprising. This is awkward. But as you, as you use them, as you play them, you say, oh yeah, they make so much sense. They make the, they make sense. Thing with fingering is it's very ingrained in the brain it's like you're creating that that path in the brain and fingering is one of the most difficult things to change but it's also something when you come back to a piece years later yep. all of a sudden you're just playing it and you might not even really remember playing the piece but all of a sudden the fingers know what they're doing so mm -hmm. that that tactile memory is incredibly strong and it's stored in the brain so yeah. it, it's as important, correct fingering is as important as learning the correct notes and the correct timing. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move on to the scherzo. scherzo. So scherzo is a musical joke. So this one has its own little humor in it. Thank you. 
two note slurs is what makes this rather adds the the uh, silly factor to it and then again so full of two note slurs so big little big little and it's um it the two note slurs also is what adds elegance to music It really creates um, a lightness and a lilt in the music. So I, I always tell my students, big little, big little. If it's a young student, I'll say sometimes, do you ever beg your mom for stuff? Please, mom, can I? Please, mom, can I go? Please, mom, can I have a cookie? So please, mom. Please, mom. So that begging, that, that uh, again big little so whichever way works and uh, sometimes I'll add words to the music to help them with the two note slurs um, you know make a story about wanting a cookie or something to that effect when we get to bar 17 <laughs> Should definitely have to be pedaled. Here I probably would wait until beat two to depress the pedal because if you depress the pedal at the beginning of the bar, you've got a lot of material. So really pedaling from beat two to beat three, just enough to connect the left hand and then of course this charming um, uh, displacement of the of bar 21 really again adds a lot of um, grace charm elegance to the music so it's um, it's really quite a lovely piece a very charming piece uh, with lots of room for expression and varying dynamics. And you know, 21, bar 21, would you paddle down, up, down, up with the two quarter notes? Or how so. would you paddle that? I would just play it. Do it, with my, do it with my hands. I'll move this camera. Just a down, up. Uh, because it's very easy to connect it. So are you using the pedal at all or no? No, no, you need to. I think it would make it. You have, yeah, and you could end up with pedal thumps, like especially on a grand piano. Yes. If you're pedaling too rapidly, if the student um, doesn't have access to that grand piano at home and they pedal rapidly, I don't know if you can hear those thumps. But the hammer or the dampers come down on the strings. Um, if you're pedaling too quickly and not controlling the speed of the pedal. So I think in that case, I wouldn't, it's perfectly, it's easy to, to connect that with the hands. So I don't think there's any need for pedal. In fact, a lot of the, the only place that I would really pedal is bar 17 to 20 with those large leaps in the left hand. But a lot of the rest of the piece, you really can do it with a legato tone. So rather than risk over pedaling, um, the other thing is too, a lot of this moves by step. If you look at bar uh, 12 to third, uh, starting bar 12. There's too much movement by step that if you pedal, it would blur. Yep. So, you know, students would have to have a very advanced, uh, uh, command of the pedal, which I don't think if they were playing this piece, which looks to be about a level seven, uh, I don't think their pedaling would be that sophisticated. Yeah, that's something we forgot to, to mention. I mean, they haven't been included in the syllabus yet, officially graded, but we kind of evaluated them. Like so, morale, I think we said about a level four. Yeah. The lead, a level seven and the canon a level five and then yeah. the again level level seven 
All right, and let's move on to the berceuse. The berceuse that we kind of, we evaluated about the level five also. So it's a lullaby. It's a lovely one. When you think lullaby, uh, it's a quiet song intended to lull a child to sleep. And just the topic, the subject, makes it easy for a student to think about slow tempo, steady pulse, and get the sounds and the character from the very beginning. Uh, the characteristics, of course, you think a soothing refrain and a rocking rhythm in, in two. So the best probably the best lullaby is is Brahms lullaby that everybody everybody knows and that was that was published in 1868 so around the same time this was what 1865 I think um the tone quality very important and should be think about thought about from the the beginning integrated in the technique in the touch in the learning process again you have a, a piece melody in the right hand, accompaniment in the left hand. Um, I would start, I think it's important to ask questions to the student. Uh, for example, fingering, she didn't write anything at the beginning. So is it better to start with a thumb? Or with a second finger? It's gonna depend on the student. One thing is for sure you don't wanna a thumb with a thumb. You know, the thumb is, would have to be very, very light. So it, it sounds like not important, but I think it makes a difference. The student try it, tries it and think about it. Um, and it's, um, it, it, it's a, you know, wonder, is the question of comfort, of sound? Uh, you try, uh, what do you prefer? It's little things, but they make the, the students listen to what they're doing um, and also realize that they have choices to make sometimes. Like you were saying earlier, you know, there's not just one way to do things. Sometimes you have options and it's their choice. And I find that um, it makes them, it has an impact on their attitude and their involvement. Uh, they think about how they feel about uh, what they prefer. and it makes them take ownership of, of the piece. And I find from experience that very quickly you realize that they, they have been thinking about it before you have mentioned anything about them. And they, they will ask you, what do you think? I thought about this, what do you think? Is it okay, does it work? And it's really exciting for a teacher when they get to that point. So think right hand first uh again uh think legato touch that's so important play it without the pedal you need to see the student needs to see how much he she can do with the fingers alone and then the pedal is added to enhance all that the expressivity the emotions and it's not um there's no danger of using the pedal as a crotch yet so no pedal and again, you have the roll of the wrist in the phrasing. Down, roll, down, and up. Notice the the accent uh, bar eight. So again, it's it because of the character of the piece. It has to be uh, expressive, weighty. 
different kind of sound than what uh, NNR was, was showing with the scale that's totally different in character. Um, so you need to think, wait, uh, there's a few sforzando uh, at the end of the page also. So again, sforzando means with, with emphasis, uh, but considering the character of the piece, you, you want to have the most beautiful sound that the piano can, can, gives you, can give you. Um, well, I would practice it just the melody and the melody in the bass. So leaving out the... So that the left hand, yes, is accompanying. Yes, it's under uh, in, ter in tone, in softer than the, the right hand, but it's still present and still singing also. Um, the other thing maybe we should talk about also is, is accents um, should be relative to the dynamic level. So an accent in a forte passage is going to be stronger than an accent in a piano passage because I sometimes have students in a piano passage, there's an accent and they just, they really hit the note. And I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> it's piano. So everything is relative and, uh, you know, has to be has to be shaped that way. So the accent at the end of line two would be relative the, to the dynamic level. Yes, absolutely. Um, one thing also is uh, how to practice. I would practice them the left hand by two. again as we were saying to keep the left hand quiet um when you play uh, one thing i should mention when you play make sure that you use the right fingering for the left hand the, the right finger uh she talking about fingerings she wrote less in this piece so uh they, they are really meaningful and some are there to create special effects and i want to um mention uh, at one point uh in the second page there's a bit of um of a crossing which relates to what you were saying earlier Elena. it's not it, it's a bit awkward but but it works also at this point there's a change in terms of phrasing the right hand is doing while the left hand is very, very legato with an accent on the first beat of 24. So it's thing like that. I find also interesting how she she worked out the phrasing, making a difference. Um, the first part, you have two bars, one, one. Two plus one plus one, and then when you get to bar nine, it's it's longer. It's like a, a long phrase of four bars. So you have the feeling that the child is quieting down and falling asleep there. Um, so th the way she phrases it uh, will have an influence on uh, the character of the piece, the story, the storytelling. Um, in terms of dynamics, it's pretty, you know, there's only, there's no indication at the very beginning. So it's up to the, the student to find uh, the sound and the sound level thinking, okay, the melody has to project. So it has to be soft, yes, but not too soft. It's still a solo, think projection. Um, I find that it's a good piece to talk about the pedal uh to uh, again very light uh but it will help to emphasize the the sforzando for example bar 16. um yeah and then we move on to the next one the the impromptu we're going back to a character similar to uh to the scherzo 
So an impromptu is a free form musical composition with uh, a character of improvisation as if prompted by the spirit of the moment. And it's usually for a solo instrument such as the piano, as in this case. It's, it's mostly a 19th century composition. You think uh, in spirit, uh, fantasy, caprice, bagatelle, and it was pretty recent. The name Impromptu uh, appeared for the first time in the 1820s, apparently. Um, so Allegro, again, a piece of music played in a fast and energetic way. The, the set there. Um, it's in G major, I find that the challenge with a student would be probably the precision of the, 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 the dotted rhythm. But it's very precise and consistent, always sound the same. The danger is that to, you know, to slow down so it goes, you don't want it to go towards the triplet. Um, and the balance between the two hands, especially when they are doubling each other. And then the left hand is accompanying, so the right hand is left to, uh, to its own there. Um, articulation phrasing, you, you, again, you find the, the role of the wrist is important, bar two. Down, up. So the, the corner note is accented and the following dotted eight, eight notes, light and short. The second page, you move on to a choral like. Section, uh, it says here, liste sous tempo, same tempo. Uh, so that would be worth checking with the with the metronome because it's such a different character when you get there. Um, and again, it's a good piece to work on on the pedal when it's legato, when it's it helps to emphasize, for example, uh, bar fourteen uh, to nineteen, the left hand, the quarter notes linked by two. note for the, the cadence to get more of um, of an effect there. Um, again, you have sometimes an interesting effect with the, the chord notes that are detached in the pedal. And, and that's really, really nice. So you get, you know, legato pedal, rhythmic pedal, uh, those kind of effects, staccato notes in the pedal. Um, and again, like you were saying, Sforzandi that have to match the characters. So of course they would be livelier uh, than, than in the, the lullaby. 
I think that, and on this, we, we were thinking level seven. Right? Yeah, correct. All right, let's move on to the sonatina. Let me just pull that up here. And this is the, um, just share my screen here. There we go. This is the Opus 18 number two, but I haven't found number one. So not sure whatever happened to number one, but it's a really a charming piece. So here's the first movie. to the recapitulation. So I, I mean, I, I absolutely love this piece. I think it's a very charming piece. I find compositionally, she states the first theme. And then in bars nine, she restates it, but now with an Alberti bass accompaniment. And then when she presents the second theme, I think I have, no, I didn't put it in here. Okay, this theme two is all these wonderful triplets. Absolutely charming. And then when she gets to the development, she takes the first theme into E flat major. Really making it very colorful. And the transition coming out of the exposition, so bar, uh, 39 to 40, the end of the end of the exposition, and then we have this lovely interlude. And we're expecting to go here, and instead, she slips into E flat major, so it's it's absolutely charming. And then she does something similar at the end of the development, which is the very bottom of that page. Uh, we've had. Half note with a pause on the half rest and then the return back into theme one. So all of these things really make it a very colorful, a very colorful work. Uh, challenges, balance of hands, of course, but then we also have two against three rhythm. Mm -hmm. 
in several spots, but a specific one here, bar 53, four, bar 54 to 55. Let me just enlarge this here. Um, uh, sorry, it actually starts in bar 52. So how to teach two against three? Um, I used, I would play uh, in bar 52 where it begins, I would play a note on the rest just to start it. So one, two, and three. One, two, and three. So it's really one, two, and three. Together, right, left, right. Together, right, left, right. So I have students practice that. Together, right, left, right. Together, right, left, right. Together, right, left, right. One, two, and three. One, two, and three. Not difficult. A uh, couple. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, but I do find the one, two, and three seems to work the best. And sometimes I'll write it out. That's quarter notes, three quarter notes, and then the other hand is like a dotted quarter note. Um, so one, two, three three quarter notes in the right hand and then the left hand has a dotted quarter note and then an eighth note tied to a quarter note so they can see it they can hear it as a one two and three um i know for me that made the most sense uh sometimes i'll add the a uh, cup of tea or not difficult afterwards but okay. counting the numbers and, and doing it very very slowly the other thing I've done, uh, this happens a lot when I teach the uh, Arabesque by Debussy. Same thing that two against three, if they haven't yeah. Sometimes I'll leave out the second, the second eighth note in the duplet. So. Also to help, so they really hear the triplet clearly so that we don't get um yes that type of rhythm so that the the triplet rules that the the triplet is the most important and uh so by leaving out the second eighth note i'll show you what i mean Let's see if this annotation works this time okay so pencil so i would leave out this note and leave out this note and here and here it's just as a mean so that they really hear the triplet rhythm if they're really struggling with this that the, the triplet rhythm is ingrained in their brain and they're listening for that and that and then eventually when we put the other note in it comes right in the middle here so that that seems to help um, other than that it's really standard sonatina teaching uh, fingering again very very important in many of these passages if you look at the bottom of that page then four on the G four on E and my being a typical pianist I tried to ignore that and I found I kept stumbling and finally I thought hmm, maybe I better look at the fingering and it works magnificent magnificently same thing in all the triplet passages uh, that are part of the second theme if you use her fingering it falls under the hands quite nicely if you don't good luck <laughs> <laughs> it will be a painful existence <laughs> all right let's move on to the second movement Uh, gonna, okay, this back. There we go. Which is a very charming minuetto.
opening the A section returns. I don't think, no, I only did one page here. Okay, what's really neat about this is the two note slur. So we're beginning on beat three. However, if we're doing a big little, the beat three is going to be heavier than beat one. So three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. So it's not until bar one, two, three, bar four, where we get the heavier beat on the downbeat. So that lends itself to a lot of grace and elegance, this three, one, two, 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 three, one, two. So it's a great piece for learning two note slurs, but if, it, it, uh, if you character it loses that grace and elegance so big little big little and i was working actually on a beethoven sonata with a student and it has a very similar character where it's always beat three i think in the case of that beethoven beat one was often tied so it's always three one two three one two and we found the first place where we actually had beat one and it really changed the whole character of it she wasn't aware it didn't occur to her, oh, beat one isn't the main beat until further in the phrase. So this is a perfect example and why it's it's so important to, to have that understanding of two note slurs. The trio is really almost like a two part invention. I think the left hand often answers the right hand. Then the left hand right hand and then they kind of join together then right hand left hand so there's lovely dialogue between the two hands in the trio so again a very a very charming and elegant um, work now she does have quite a few dynamics in this particular piece mm -hmm and the hairpins so it's it's a great piece for musicality all right and the finale the finale and then i take over from your manuetto uh it says espesso tempo so the same speed a similar character so i have a 16 bar transition before getting into the allegro molto moderato. So again, it's in three and it changes the character gradually.
is going on. So I'll stop here. Uh, a few characteristics here. The beginning, you can hear how I get the, the same the notes two by two with the rest, uh, creating suspense. Uh, sometimes I find that the students find it hard to leave the pedal and deal with those rests, deal with the nothingness, with the... <gasps> so I have to tell them, no, it's part of the expressivity, the character of the piece. Create, you're creating suspenses uh, with that. Um, so the pedal, of course, is essential to connect those two and create those sounds. Um, there, the student, we were talking about uh, asking questions to the students, helping them, you know, realize that they they can make decisions here. Uh, they There are different options on how dividing the notes between reading the, the hands, so they can experiment with that. Um, in terms of tempo, it says uh, writing allegro molto moderato. So again, uh, close to, but not quite allegro, uh, I would say molto, more moderato than, than allegro. Uh, because this, again, needs to, to sing. And we're going back to the importance of allegato line. And her fingering really, really helps. You have to twist and turn around up over the thumb and stretch. So it kind of um, helps to create the shape of the, the phrase, the design of the melody there. Uh, and you get the, it's in, you turn into six eight. So you, you get kind of a rocking. Now I find it quite intricate uh, to practice that section, I would say up to from 18 to the, the bottom of the page, simply because uh, the left end, the, the, the important notes uh, change. So again, I would uh, suggest practicing it. Um, the left end in different ways, because the left end has a, a counterpoint melody that one needs to be aware of, and then you get into a groove, and then suddenly it changes. So I would say different ways. Uh, I would play the right hand melody, very legato. Again, you need to know, the student needs to know how much he, she can do with the legato fingers alone before adding the pedal. So I would suggest playing the right hand, which has one, one, and three. One, two, three, one, two, three, one. Quarter note, and do the same with the left hand, meaning. And you'll see, you'll feel how it changes when you get to the middle of 35, uh, 25, sorry. at first still I played it like that and you realize why what was happening and it felt much better and then you can play games like uh, two notes one note again for handprint and a quiet left hand it will help for the evenness and also for the balance between the voices uh now you get into uh the trill bar 35 i think it's pretty obvious that you you start with the main note there i would recommend one three it's always easier to to play the trill with two fingers that don't follow each other for the rotation and it it makes it easier to to create that crescendo there. And then you have a piacere, literally as you please at 
pleasure at like you want at at liberty so uh, again decision time it's up to the student to decide how he she wants to play this at which temple and the the cadenza how to group those notes and it says sempre ralentendo and diminuendo like starting where how much um and again you find that those rest those suspense up in the air thing um the rhythmic pedal of course helps a lot same thing often you find the wrist movement is is very important for the the expressivity of the piece to create the the progression um and sforzando again so in terms of um fingering um they make so much sense uh you go back to the theme here and it's going to be different you have a passage like that where you, again you have to turn on your thumb later um she uses a uh, substitution later in the piece um, with the theme. So very, very legato, going towards to, to, uh, towards legatissimo. We're talking, I'm talking here about um, uh, the pickup to 147 to, at the end. Um, and so again, it forces you to, to stretch a little bit and it creates automatically a rubato. Um, substitution, uh, and again, crossing over fingers, but always keeping in mind legato line. It's a beautiful sonata, sonata. and we were thinking uh, level eight for each movement, right? I think possibly level nine for the last one, but it would be it would be a great competition piece or to play the, would, whole thing. the the third movement, and that's why I didn't play play it in its entity. Uh, it's it's seven pages long, so it it is longer. It's a beautiful movement very well written very contrasting another example of of a woman who wrote magnificent music but i would never heard of her until i you know i found these pieces so there's certainly a lot of music out there and more and more coming all the time so more and more is being discovered hidden away in the libraries on dusty shelves and there you know there's an awareness now that uh, which is which is wonderful to see Yes. Well, it, this morning the 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 French Bibliothèque Nationale announced that they were working on they they realized after all that time that they have lots of manuscripts of pieces written by women composers, uh, first editions, and so they're bring, they they're working to bring all that back to the surface. I hope they have um, they have air filters for when these dust bunnies start hopping around. Yes, because they've been staying there on their shelf for a long, long time. They uh, 200, 300 years. So, yeah, these, and, you know, <laughs> yeah, and, and nobody was was looking for it. I remember in the late uh, 1980s working there and they still had the index cards. And I would be looking for Julie Candé, you know, I had those names and there was no Julie, there was Jules. So they would just assume that women could not compose. So it had to be a mistake. So they would write, they would correct it and put a, a man's name. So they, they didn't know what they had. You know, I, I, I was uh, guilty of the same when I found a piece. We were all. Yeah, Sh Chaminade, and then I did some research, you know, who's Chaminade? A woman? And I I was astounded. I thought, no, it can't be, can't be. And <laughs> so, I mean, guilty, you know, and uh, we were it's- all guilty. Yeah. yeah. We, just, we were trying to not to see that, to just assume that it, it just couldn't, we were told it couldn't be. 
I, I like to be honest. I look back now and I think, well, I never questioned. You know, no. were the women that wrote, and never even thought of it. We just we accepted because we were told Bach, Beethoven, Haydn, Mozart, Chopin. You know, uh, obscure composer for me was Stravinsky. Who? And, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, it just never, it just never even occurred to me. So it, it's wonderful. Like, it's, it's great to just find, you know, these treasure troves and, and beautiful yeah. music. Yeah, and and I hope they'll find more pieces by, yeah. by her. There's yeah. a Dagger and what is, was it the romance that we yeah. found also for more advanced? Yeah, yeah. Novels. And uh, so hopefully more will come out. And looking also to publish some some duets by women because there there's very little uh, you know very little that's been published. So I have the the Virdo, but uh, working on uh, on a couple of others. That's fantastic. That's great. And it's so much fun to to work on to do some forehand piano music. It's yeah. because as pianists often we miss the social connection. You know we're always practicing alone in our studio. So it's nice to play, to do music with somebody else, to do chamber music. And this is perfect. Yeah, exactly. Well, thanks both of you for, for putting on such a show again today. And your natural conversation back and forth is just enhanced every time we, every time we take it in and listen to it. So for those well, of you watching We're having a great time. We're yeah. having a great time working together. <laughs> it shows. Good. Any questions from those of you that are on the live audience, just throw them in the chat box. But I assume you've been following along and those of you on YouTube as well. And those of you watching after the fact, whenever that may be, today's November 10th, 2023. And hopefully for years, this these videos will stay up live on our YouTube channel. Is there any, does anybody have any questions? So no, don't see anything at the moment. No, you, you both do such a, a thorough job entertaining. I know our audiences, when they get such a detail, there's there's no questions that come forward because you're already giving us so much. I think that's what's happening here. But if anyone has any questions, feel free to email us anytime. Absolutely. Yep. In the meantime, I'll chat with you both about when you want to come back. I don't know if we actually have a date figured out yet. And I've got some bookings into January, you've heard. So we may have to adjust our original plan a little bit. But we'll get that figured out. And everyone else, we'll see you in two weeks' time on Friday, November 24th, where Alessandra Chenzo is going to come and join us. She'll also be joining us in the new year with a couple of other things. I think you'll find her creativity really interesting. So I hope you'll check that out. Watch your emails. You won't get an email from me next week, but you will the week after. And if you're attending convocation next next week, please come and say hi. I plan to be there. And if any of you are there, I'd love to meet you in person. Great. Looking forward to seeing everybody there next weekend in London, Ontario. Well, okay. I wish I could be there. 